Hello and welcome to Bringing Economic Abuse into the Mainstream. I'm Sarah Canullo and I'm the Fellowship Director at the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust UK. I'm delighted to be hosting this event alongside my colleague Rose Clapham, who works with Fellow Engagement and Development at the Winston Churchill Trust Australia. Uh, before we start, I'd like to remind you that this event is being recorded so that it can be shared later. The Winston Churchill Memorial Trust in the UK and Australia were founded in 1965. The Trust provide overseas research grants to allow British and Australian citizens to travel overseas and conduct research in their chosen fields. The grants we provide are not academic, they support outstanding individuals from across society in conducting practical research anywhere in the world and find innovative solutions to real world problems. Both trusts have responded to the COVID-19 pandemic by allowing fellows to take all or some of their fellowships online. Uh, when fellows complete their research, we support them in disseminating and sharing their findings with others. And that's why we're here today. I'm delighted to introduce two Churchill Fellows and not-for-profit founders who've worked hard to increase recognition of economic abuse as a form of coercive and controlling behavior within the context of domestic abuse. Their research has supported victim survivors who are still too often left facing devastating economic consequences when perpetrators are too rarely held to account. This session will look at the latest developments and identify key changes needed to better support people experiencing economic abuse. Our first speaker will be Rebecca Glenn, a 2019 Australia Fellow. Rebecca is the founder of the not-for-profit Centre for Women's Economic Safety, She's also the Assistant Director of Insight Exchange, a domestic violence service management, working to inform and strengthen social service and systemic responses to domestic and family violence. Before mo moving into the domestic violence sector, Rebecca worked in financial wellbeing at the Commonwealth Bank of Australia and was previously the founding CEO of not-for-profit organization, Financial Literacy Australia. In 2019, she received a Churchill Fellowship to investigate overseas responses to economic abuse. Our second speaker will be Dr. Nicola sharp Jeffs, a 2016 UK Fellow. Nicola is an expert in economic abuse as it occurs within the context of coercive control. She has worked in the violence against women and girls sector since 2006 and held policy influencing and research roles before moving into charity leadership. In 2016, Nicola traveled to the United States and Australia to explore innovative responses to economic abuse. Her determination ensured that women in the UK have access to the same responses by establishing surviving economic abuse in 2017. The charity's mission is to raise awareness of economic abuse and transform responses to it. In October 2020, Nicola was awarded an OBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours for services to victims of domestic and economic abuse. I really hope you'll enjoy this event. There'll be an opportunity to ask questions after the presentation, um, but you can put your questions in the Q&A box at any point during the presentation and they will be picked up later. Um, so I'll hand over to Rebecca to begin our session. Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you to the Churchill Trust in Australia for giving me this opportunity to do the fellowship um, and to the trust in both countries, obviously, for supporting this event today. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm joining you today from Sydney uh, on the unceded land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all First Nations people joining this webinar. I know there are people joining us from many different lands and places, uh, some of which, of course, are places that I would have travelled to to undertake this fellowship had it not been for the COVID pandemic, uh, including, of course, visiting Nicola in England one day. Um, but Nicola and I have met in person uh, in Australia back in the day when one could travel internationally. Uh, and that meeting actually sowed the seeds for why we're here today, for me at least. Uh, that was about five years ago. Um, you just heard I used to work at the Commonwealth Bank and I had just commissioned um, the development of a, a, a guide to addressing um, financial abuse in partnership with financial with um, domestic violence, New South Wales, sorry. Um, 
And I heard at that time that there was going to be this panel discussion with an expert from England in economic abuse. And so I thought, well, I'm obviously going to have to get along to that. Um, and of course, that expert was um, Dr. Nicola Sharp Jeffs, who was doing her Churchill Fellowship at the time. So uh, since then, Nicola set up the um, surviving economic abuse. I've moved into the domestic violence sector and even more recently set up the Centre for Women's Economic Safety. And, uh, really throughout all of that and doing the fellowship, um, Nicola has been an inspiration and, and a huge support, um, particularly doing my fellowship remotely and introducing me to lots of people. So thank you, Nicola, for, for everything you've done. I really appreciate it. Um, today, I'm going to share uh, just a few highlights from my Churchill Fellowship, um, demonstrating some of the ways that economic abuse can be brought into the mainstream. Uh, in my report, you'll read a lot more about the work of surviving economic abuse than I'll share with you this evening, because this evening we have, or this morning, <laughs> we have the opportunity to hear from Nick um, herself. Uh, so my fellowship, I'm just going to share my screen now. My fellowship was awarded to um, investigate responses to women experiencing uh, domestic economic abuse in the UK, the USA and Canada. Uh, and instead of traveling to those places last year, as was the plan before COVID, um, I've actually spent uh, my summer, the summer of the Southern Hemisphere, so December through February, on video calls uh, with people I would otherwise have visited. So as part of my fellowship, I interviewed 32 people representing 23 different organizations. Uh, I suspect that many of the people joining us today are familiar with the term economic abuse, but for those who aren't as familiar, it's basically referring to a form of domestic and family violence in which one person restricts or exploits another person's economic resources in a way that threatens their economic security and potential for self-sufficiency. So that could look like one partner controlling all the money or withholding necessities, uh, sabotaging their partner's ability to earn an income or building up debts in the other person's name. There are many different tactics, um, but usually economic abuse is not the only thing going on. It's usually co-occurring with other forms of violence and abuse. Uh, indeed, it's estimated that 85% of women experiencing domestic, domestic violence are also experiencing economic abuse as part of the broader pattern of abuse. Uh, I'm not going to be sharing any more detailed descriptions of abuse than that. I can't speak for Nick, but um, you know, if this does raise any issues for you, any of the content today, please feel free to step away, um, seek out a friend or, or can contact a specialist helpline. Uh, in Australia, you can call 1-800-RESPECT. And, and if you are seeking um, assistance or where you might be able to find some more support for um, economic abuse, the Centre for Women's Economic Safety does have a directory um, with a range of um, uh, resources that you can find in your state or territory. Uh, so my starting point for the Churchill was, I guess, my concern that many people experiencing economic abuse don't know where to turn for support. And that's what drove um, the development of that directory. Uh, quite often, in fact, people experiencing economic abuse haven't actually named it in their own mind as what's happening um, within the scope of abuse they're experiencing. Uh, frontline services, of course, are seeing economic abuse all the time, uh, but often because of the way it's interwoven with other forms of abuse. Uh, it's almost picked up as a side note. And of course, frontline workers need to focus on immediate safety needs, which may mean that some aspects of economic abuse are not being um, addressed. So I guess in my mind, given that the, um, the consequences of economic abuse are so devastating and long lasting, that the existing responses I was seeing um, in Australia just didn't seem quite commensurate with the impact uh, and so I wanted to learn about what kinds of other things, um, what kinds of things other countries were doing and what might work in the Australian context. Uh, and I guess some of the barriers uh, that I um, see in Australia and I've seen elsewhere are really a low public awareness and understanding of economic abuse um, and a frontline response to domestic and family violence that's already under-resourced and overburdened. So I was interested in practices that placed minimal time or cost burden on existing domestic and family violence um, services, increased the capacity uh, to respond and the quality of responses, both inside the domestic violence sector and outside. Uh, 
practices that were cost effective or scalable uh, and, and practices that contributed to increased public awareness. So of the 23 organizations that were represented among my interviewees, four of those organizations were expressly focused on economic abuse. And I interviewed the founders of all of these organizations. So surviving economic abuse, obviously, um, committed to raising awareness of and transforming responses to economic abuse. Uh, Free From in the US focused on dismantling the nexus between intimate partner violence and financial insecurity and building survivor wealth. The Center for Survivor Agency and Justice, uh, also in the US, um, which is focused on enhancing advocacy for survivors of intimate partner violence in support of physical safety, economic security and dignity. And finally, the Canadian Center for Women's Empowerment with a focus on economic abuse dedicated to empowering domestic violence survivors through advocacy, mentorship and economic empowerment. What I found uh, consistently was, um, I guess, frustration at how ill-equipped systems were to respond to economic abuse in the intimate partner context. Uh, as a result, I think a lot of the responses that I saw were um, really responses to filling in system gaps or providing workarounds. So as an example of that in the US, uh, you've got this obviously highly fragmented country with lots of states, 50 states and the number of territories. Uh, and every one of those has a different system of victims compensation. It has different civil legal remedies and different welfare safety nets. Uh, so in response to that, Free From developed an online tool called the Compensation Compass, which helps in a really easy step-by-step -step way, helps survivors assess what restitution or payments they may be eligible for and takes into account their circumstances and um, capacity to, to, seek those, to seek that restitution. Uh, another great example um, is the Centre for Survivor Agency and Justice, which developed a guidebook on consumer and economic civil legal advocacy for survivors. Uh, it's a really comprehensive guidebook because it's really confusing territory and it covers everything from credit reporting and repair uh, to economic relief and civil protection orders. Uh, and rights and protections in a range of other arenas, such as housing and employment. But I think I can characterize um, the most promising practice I've found as having three things in common. And they were that they were survivor centric in their approach. They focused on reducing barriers to safety and justice, and they worked to expand the ecosystem of responders. Uh, and so many of the people I spoke to, and, and especially the four organisations with this focus, um, is that their work has to be two-pronged. It has to work to provide better supports and better information to victim survivors, uh, and they need to advocate for systems change. Uh, so my report, uh, my Churchill report, makes 14 recommendations for Australia across these areas, improving responses, building capacity of organisations to respond and improving systems. Uh, so I'm going to share just a couple of highlights from my fellowship with you and how they've translated into recommendations for, uh, for Australia. Uh, and I'm very happy and I believe we can share um, with everyone who's registered for this event my final report, uh, which should be published in a few weeks time. So the first highlight um, was something I saw in several places in the UK and a really interesting example in the US, um, which was direct cash assistance to victim survivors. So in the US, uh, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Free From launched a survivor safety fund to provide survivors with cash grants of $250 to support them in staying safe or getting safe. And an interesting aspect uh, of this was that the application for the grant, which was very short and simple, um, included an option to respond to a survey about how they were doing financially uh, there was expressly no obligation to do the survey and respondents were um, assured repeatedly it was not um, relevant to or would not impact on them getting a grant. Um, but what's been so compelling about this piece of work is the opportunity to hear directly from survivors about their needs during COVID. Uh, and they were really, um, I guess, an amplification of the needs, the pre-existing needs. So the survey found that cash was the number one most urgent need to get and stay safe during the pandemic. And most survivors uh, named a figure between $700 and $800 US, um, about $1,000 Australian as the amount they needed to stay safe. 
Uh, and, the, and the last thing that I found really interesting in um, the survey was qualitatively the power of receiving money with no strings attached, uh, which was remarkable. Uh, so I want to share just a couple of quotes um, from survivors from that survey, uh, which go to the heart of that. So the first one there, I would hope this is talking to their elected representatives. I would hope that my representatives acknowledge that most survivors already deal with financial abuse and control as to how we can or should spend our money. They should take the opportunity to support us and give us the freedom and trust us to use the help the best that we can. So in the US, a lot of the um, support that goes to people is by form of vouchers. Um, often they're very limited about where they can be used or what they can be used for. And the second quote there, as someone who is undocumented, getting relief, help, aid has proven very difficult, making an already hard situation worse. Adding roadblocks to funds in an effort to prevent folks who don't need it always hurts those that do. So that example um, in the US of someone undocumented has echoes uh, across all of the countries in focus of my fellowship. In the UK, as in Australia, there are people who can't access welfare support who would otherwise be eligible, uh, except for their immigration status. So another organisation I spoke with is Southall Black Sisters in London. Um, it's a charity that works with black minority women who've experienced domestic violence and other gender-based violence. So in the UK, migrant and refugee women on a range of temporary visas are known as having what they call no recourse to public funds. Uh, and that's not just about not being able to access money or income support. Without that access to public funds, you're also ineligible for a range of other supports, including housing, healthcare and emergency assistance. So in response to that, Southall Black Sisters established the No Recourse Fund to help with emergency housing and living costs. That fund was set up in 2010 and they have been advocating before and since then um, for a safety net for women on temporary visas who are experiencing domestic abuse and unfortunately so far without success. Uh, so that fund, it's a small last resort fund that supports women by non-governmental organisations who are also committed to assisting women to pursue other um, avenues for financial and legal help. Uh, a couple of the other um, examples of providing direct cash assistance, which just looks so promising. Uh, one is NatWest and Safe Lives. NatWest is one of the large banks in England, and it's partnered with uh, the domestic violence charity Safe Lives to provide direct cash grants to survivors uh, via uh, local domestic violence service providers. So the grants are typically around two to three hundred pounds. Uh, they can go up to a thousand pounds. Um, but that two to three hundred, that's more like four or five hundred dollars Australian. Uh, there's no requirement on the survivor to apply. It's the domestic violence service provider who makes the call based on need and gives the money directly to them. Uh, and the last example uh, I want to share with you is a uh, it's part of a broader initiative called the Whole Housing Approach, which holds enormous um, value, I think, in supporting someone's economic safety. But the, the element that relates to direct cash assistance is a component called the uh, flexible funding component. So again, uh, the funds are administered by a specialist domestic abuse service, uh, and they support victim survivors to achieve or maintain safe and secure housing. Importantly, there's no set list of what will and won't be funded and no requirement to produce evidence um, victim survivors are simply encouraged to ask for whatever will make the most difference in their housing situation. Uh, and the, the amount of those payments was uh, usually between five and six hundred pounds or around a thousand dollars Australian. And so what I really like about this is um, it feels like there's a movement, part of a hopefully a broader movement towards um, towards trusting survivors away from those paternalistic responses. Um, and working on the base survivors know best um, that what their needs and priorities are. Uh, and promisingly, since I've finished my interviews in the US, the Biden Harris administration has pledged five billion, that's right, with a B, um, five billion dollars uh, to community organizations to provide cash grants to survivors in need. And that need can be daycare, it could be transportation for work, it could be a laptop um, to re-engage with employment. So I think that's fantastic. So my recommendation for Australia is to expand flexible funding and direct cash assistance to victim survivors. 
Uh, we do have a model in the state of Victoria um, that, that I think we could adopt nationally, the flexible support package. And I think that would be um, an excellent development. Um, the other highlight I wanted to share with you was um, the way in which particularly the four organisations with this focus were working right across the ecosystem to build the capacity of professionals to understand and respond to economic abuse. So that includes upskilling domestic and family violence workers, debt advisors, financial capability workers, local authorities, uh, also employers, banks, police, lawyers and local communities. Um, and in every instance, there's, you know, there's a need to adapt the content to the context. So um, I saw everything from, you know, a one hour talk or a webinar like this, um, or a half day training, perhaps for police or a multi session program um, for perhaps domestic abuse workers. Uh, there were also a couple of programs designed to train the trainer. So that domestic abuse advocates are then able to work with survivors. So examples of that in the US were uh, the Moving Ahead Through Financial Management Curriculum, uh, which was developed by the National Network to End Domestic Violence and the Allstate Foundation. Um, that's probably the largest program of its kind that I saw. It's been delivered to something like 10,000 advocates so far. Uh, and another newer program uh, was developed by FreeFrom, which is the Survivor Wealth and Wellness Certification Program. Uh, there were a range of other capacity building projects. Um, I'll, I'll list just a couple. Uh, the Center for Survivor Agency of Justice, again, um, had a building partnerships for economic justice initiative. Um, so this is a place-based program that develops partnerships between domestic violence advocates, consumer rights advocates, and lawyers. Uh, and it's really working to break down the silos to be able to build capacity of organisations in support of the economic needs of survivors. Um, another one was a Futures Without Violence, an organization I haven't mentioned yet, uh, based in Washington, DC. Uh, they've got some excellent workplace initiatives that aim to um, help workplaces support survivors to either maintain their employment um, and also to regain employment in a supported environment. Uh, and surviving economic abuse, I know you'll be talking, uh, Nick, about some of this, but just some great work that you're doing, um, including across housing, uh, banking, uh, and I was really impressed with uh, the program that you deliver um, uh, with police, um, that's partly in partnership with Safe Lives and police themselves, but, um, you know, a deep dive into economic abuse and how to evidence that for police, which is amazing. Um, in Australia, we're not starting from scratch. Uh, there's some great training already in place. Uh, particularly, I want to, to note the, the work of uh, Women's Informational Information and Referral Exchange, WIRE, um, because they've really blazed the trail on this front. Um, so my recommendation for Australia is to expand training in economic abuse for the family violence sector and beyond. And, and I do just want to note that um, while economic abuse has to be understood within a broader understanding of coercive control and domestic violence, I believe it needs dedicated training, not because I think it's any more important than any other form of abuse, but because it does impact options so severely and has really specific and practical consequences which need to be addressed. Uh, if they're not addressed, the abuse has a ripple effect that can further impact other domains of well-being. So I think the training piece is really important. Uh, and one last thing I wanted to highlight from my report, and I share this as part of my handover to Nicola, is uh, the advocacy that's happening really across all three countries to have legal recognition of economic abuse, which is an important first step to improving system responses. Uh, so the Canadian Centre for Women's Empowerment has called on the government there to expand the national gender-based violence strategy to include economic abuse and create a statutory definition of economic abuse. In the US, only one state, which is Maine, um, has a definition of economic abuse on the statute book. So the advocacy there at the moment is to see a definition of economic abuse added to the Federal Violence Against Women Act, um, from which sort of most of the activity across the country um, stems. Uh, in Australia, the state that I'm based in, New South Wales, is the only state that does not define economic abuse in law. Uh, and so it's another recommendation of my report that this be rectified. 
Uh, and I did recently make a submission to the New South Wales Parliamentary Joint Select Committee on Coercive Control that any new domestic violence or coercive control legislation uh, includes a, a definition of economic abuse. So all I can hope is that we might follow uh, the success of surviving economic in the, uh, abuse in the UK, uh, which has been instrumental in ensuring that economic abuse be included in the UK's new domestic abuse bill, uh, and further has successfully advocated for the bill to incorporate post-separation abuse, which was not originally covered. So with that, I might stop sharing my screen and hand over to uh, Dr. Nicola Sharp Jeffs, the founder and CEO of Surviving Economic Abuse, uh, to share with you more about her journey. That's great, thanks, Beck. So I'm gonna try and share my screen similarly. And of course, my presentation has disappeared. <laughs> As it always does when this happens. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm just going to give it another go. Oh, there we go. Success. Fantastic. So thanks for the thumbs up, Rose. Uh, so good morning or good evening um, or good early hours of the morning, depending on when the world uh, you're watching this webinar. I think we've been totally overwhelmed um, by the number of people who have registered for it. Um, so thank you very much um, if you have um, well up at an ungodly hour um, to catch Beck and I this morning um, and to thank both of the trusts um, in the UK and Australia um, for supporting this event. Uh, it's kind of really exciting to kind of bring together this global picture and to be able to share it with you this morning. So as um, Sarah said, I undertook my Winston Churchill um, Fellowship back in 2016. Uh, I still kind of see it as a kind of moment that kind of changed everything for me, um, altered um, all of my life in very many ways. Um, it was the beginning of um, the story, which is surviving economic abuse. Um, as Sarah said, after I'd travelled and seen what was being done in other countries, it just felt wrong that victims and survivors in the UK didn't have access uh, to some of those great initiatives, which Beck has already spoken to. Um, so it was a little bit scary, but I just, you know, decided that the work had to be done. So today I'm just going to tell you a little bit about that story. Um, and I really just want to kind of reinforce and kind of interweave into it um, the difference that the, um, the fellowship made for me. So in 2016, I'd actually been researching economic abuse for nearly a decade. I'd started to work um, for a domestic um, abuse charity back in 2008 where I worked very closely with victims and survivors and was really struck by the economic impact of abuse and the experience of economic abuse in and of itself. Um, and I think what really drove my passion, I suppose, was that I was speaking to victims and survivors that could have been myself. You know, this can happen to anybody and it's when an abuser either takes advantage of some um, economic dependence um, or creates to, um, seeks to create um, economic dependence um within a relationship um, and i think seeing how victims and survivors were struggling in terms of the process of rebuilding their lives and how their potential um, had been thwarted that's not to say that i don't think they would not necessarily have gone on to reach their full potential but you could just see how they were spending sort of many years and a lot of time and energy trying to deal with the impact of um, abuse um, broadly and economic abuse specifically um, and it just, you know, made me really angry because, you know, there was this one person who'd sought to control their life in such a way um, that it stopped them from sort of achieving what they wanted to do in life um, and their ambitions. Um, and in 2011, I actually went into um, academia um, and I went in purely because of this study that I'm showing you. Uh, it was a really exciting study. Having worked in a domestic abuse charity for many years, a lot of charities, uh, a lot of funders, sorry, would say, well, what happens to the victims and survivors after they leave the service? And, you know, we were always struggling, you know, as Beck said, to actually provide the service in the first place. So to have the resource to actually track victims and survivors after leaving was just something that wasn't available. Um, but this funding was made available. And through the Child and Women Abuse Studies Unit at London Met, which is where I was working, in partnership with a frontline organisation called Solace Women's Aid based in London, um, we actually tracked um, 100 victims and survivors and their children after leaving the services um, at Solace Women's Aid to see what their process of rebuilding their life looked like. Um, and it's probably the greatest privilege um, of my life still um, leading that study 
catching up with women over a three year period across five interviews and looking at how their life had changed from, you know, kind of crisis um, accessing services to kind of rebuilding and moving forward. Um, and I talked to them about many issues across many different um, areas of their life. Um, but unsurprisingly, I was particularly interested in their economic well-being. Um, and I think you can see uh, from this chart that um, the trajectory, I suppose, of their economic well-being um, started pretty low. Um, we're looking at the green line um, and stayed pretty low. Um, and also that alongside physical violence, um, which sadly also continued. So again, it's one of those big myths really around domestic abuse that you should leave the abuser. Um, that's, you know, that's the answer. But of course, we know coercive control continues post-separation and actually at the point of separation and in the six months after is a time when um, a victim survivor is at increased risk of homicide. So just leaving sadly doesn't mean that the abuse stops. And certainly in relation to the economic abuse piece, um, because you don't require that physical proximity um, in the same way you do physical abuse for example it was you know a particularly powerful way um, of continuing to abuse um, but what I would say is that economic and physical safety are absolutely interlinked um, and again back to kind of Beck's point about how sometimes this isn't seen as an immediate safety need um, actually it is because if a victim survivor doesn't have the economic resources they need to leave in the first place how are they going to exit a situation uh, where they're being physically abused um, it just means that they're going to stay in a situation they don't want to be for longer and experience more harm as a result so it's something we all really, always really, really push that economic stability actually underpins um, physical safety. Um, so I suppose um, the chart here shows what we were trying to show um, was increasing space for action for victims and survivors. So to go back to kind of Beck's definition, which is about the control um, of one partner by another, um, we saw that control is all encompassing and we know that is coercive control. And certainly it's recognised in the UK um, through the Coercive and Controlling Behaviour Offence in Serious Crime Act of 2015. Um, but the flip side of coercive control is space for action. And what we were looking to do was to see how space for action increased um, when coercive control decreased. Um, as I said, post-separation abuse was something that meant space for action didn't increase in the way victims and survivors would always want it to. Um, but also, again, Becca spoke into those systems issues. So sometimes it was actually the broader environment that they were working in. Um, or seeking to rebuild their lives in um, that was preventing them from doing what they wanted to do. Um, so again, back to what Beck was saying, it's all about kind of expanding that ecosystem. So all of the work at Surviving Economic Abuse is about how can we um, expand the space for actions for victims and survivors, um, both at the individual level, um, all the way through to what government's doing to facilitate that space for action. So I was aware of good practice um, internationally um, and decided to travel to the US um, in 2016 um, and then Australia in November 2016. Um, and as I said um, in my intro, I think at that point it made me realise I needed to be the change that I wanted to see. I'd kind of sat around for 10 years waiting for someone to do this and nobody did. So right, OK, I was going to have to get on with it. Um, but what I would say is that the Winston Churchill Fellowship really provided me with the foundations um, in which to do that. You know, I didn't kind of start with a blank bit of paper. I had the recommendations in the same way Beck now has her recommendations um, that I made within my fellowship report. So that really enabled me, I think, to be really strategic from the beginning. And what I would also say is that it was just so valuable having that international learning um, to draw on. Um, and it brought me into contact with a kind of a community of people like Beck um, who cared as deeply as I do um, about this issue and have kind of informed my thinking about it um, and inspired me ever since. Um, and Beck mentioned WIRE, um, which is a fantastic organisation um, in Melbourne, led by Julie Kuhn, um, who's their CEO. Uh, I don't know if you're listening, Julie, but if you are, she was the person who kind of facilitated my access to Australia um, and made a huge difference. Um, so I would just like to, to recognise that. Um, but, you know, as Beck said, we would love to have caught up, um, you know, during her fellowship. Um, she was all planned to come to the UK and she was in our calendar. Um, and it was really disappointing that she couldn't make it. Um, but we have met back in 2016, um, and that photograph of the Commonwealth Bank, Beck, is just reference um, to the fact that we met back then. Um, and, um, and hopefully we'll meet again one day in the future when we're allowed to travel. So I suppose the key thing for me, um, and I think this was kind of most of my learning from Victoria, actually, um, in Australia, because I'd just um, gone to Australia just as the um, Royal Commission into Family Violence um, 
kind of um, inquiry was concluding and had made a number of recommendations specifically around economic abuse was that you really needed to recognize economic abuse within the national sort of policy legislation um, kind of context um, if you were going to create sort of a, a framework for responses really because you kind of needed to acknowledge that this was a thing um, and timing is everything really um, so sometimes I you know I'm a bit hard on myself for waiting 10 years to do this work but actually in many ways I think I did it just at the right time um, so I'd kind of decided in January 2017 that I was going to set the charity up and then in June 2017 uh, the Queen brought forward new legislation um, in the Queen's speech um, the domestic abuse bill and um, you know that was just fantastic because it meant already I kind of had a tool uh, to kind of start working and to start influencing recognition of economic abuse so the domestic abuse bill um, introduces for the first time a statutory definition of domestic abuse um, and we've just worked really really hard from the beginning um, to influence government to recognize economic abuse within that statutory definition um, which they did which is very exciting um, and for those of you um, following the bill um, it actually goes back to the lords tomorrow um, after um, having been through both houses now um, and we're very close to receiving royal assent uh, so you know very, very soon economic abuse will be recognised um, in statute. And I think the other really exciting thing for me was um, working with the Westminster government um, because the domestic abuse bill mostly covers um, England and Wales. There are certain provisions already that exist in Scotland um, and Northern Ireland um, was that we were able to kind of work to actually define um, what economic abuse was um, in statute. So, you know, for someone who's worked in this area for so many years to actually have a definition um, is also really exciting. And it very much draws on the um, Adam Zettel 2008 definition uh, that Beck showed. So, you know, that's a great thing that I was able to feed back uh, to Adrian Adams, um, based in Michigan in the US, who's someone I also met, um, you know, to kind of really demonstrate, you know, how her academic research is absolutely informing uh, responses to victims and survivors in the UK going forward. So, I think um, just a point to make alongside recognising economic abuse in statute is that um, if you do recognise something in this way, it's hugely validating for victims and survivors of economic abuse. So certainly when um, the charity started and I was doing a lot of speaking about economic abuse, I was being contacted by a lot of victims and survivors saying, wow, that's actually what I've experienced. I just didn't have a name for it. And it was hugely validating for them. And I think also, um, in addition to a kind of recognition of what they'd been through and how difficult that was, it also meant for the first time they had the language to communicate to other people what had happened to them. So certainly that kind of advocacy piece where they might want to speak to the police or local services, um, they kind of finally had a language to be able to use. And again, the recognition of economic abuse in the Domestic Abuse Act kind of only extends that um, and the difference that it will make in terms of self-advocacy. Um, as I've already kind of um, illustrated, I hope the work that I do is always grounded in the needs of victims and survivors, um, you know, kind of via the um, charities that I've worked for that have been direct service providers and also doing research directly with victims and survivors. So it was really important that everything that we did at Surviving Economic Abuse was driven by the lived experience of victims and survivors. Um, and actually, um, victims and survivors, as I said, reached out um, back in 2017 very sadly, there was just nothing that you could suggest that was going to be of, of support for them. Um, but what I did say is that, you know, we're working to try and change that. And if you want to be part of that change, then please work alongside us to do that. Um, and that was the beginning of what we call the Experts by Experience group. Uh, so we've never gone out looking for victims and survivors um, to be part of that group. They've always come to us, um, which I just think demonstrates, you know, the strength and determination and resilience um, of this group um, who do want to make a change for other people who come behind them. Um, and so we now work with over 100 victims and survivors directly, and they really do inform um, absolutely everything that we do. And uh, this report cover is um, a summary of a round table that we held um, actually at the Home Office. So as part of the consultation around the domestic abuse bill, we brought um, 18 women together who'd contacted the charity um, and provided them with an opportunity to talk about their experience of economic abuse and the impact that it had on their lives. Um, and civil servants, um, have said retrospectively that that made a huge difference for them in terms of really understanding um, the needs of victims and survivors and really kind of helped them push our message to ministers around including economic abuse um, within the domestic abuse definition. 
Um, but as you can see from that title, um, economic abuse is your past, present and future. Um, you know, it is such a form of abuse that does continue post-separation that it can be really, really hard um, to lose all um, control um, from an abuser going forward. Um, there were women around that table who had been abused for 30 or 40 years post-separation um, through interference with their economic well-being. Um, so it's a really, it's a really big job. Um, we've only just started, I would say. Um, but as I said, you know, introducing um, economic abuse within the new legislation created a fantastic framework um, within which we could then start working. Um, because once government had recognised this as a form of abuse, um, then they needed to demonstrate that they were doing something about it. Uh, so we were fortunate to um, be successful in putting forward project proposals um, with a number of our partners to work with specialists um, across a range of different areas. Um, so that was money and debt advice. Um, housing um, and policing, and I think um, Beck has spoken to all those different things. So there is so much that I could talk about in terms of what we've done in the last sort of four to five years, but I just wanted to focus on just a couple of examples, um, which are really kind of inspired by my travels um, via the fellowship. Um, so the first was our work in banking. Um, and again, through the Home Office, we were able to um, start working with banks and building societies in the UK. Um, and this was really inspired um, by my time in Australia. Again, um, my travels actually coincided with the publication of some guidelines um, that um, had come off the back of the um, Victoria um, Royal Commission into family violence. And these guidelines were, how, um, were around how banks um, should respond um, to family violence, which is kind of the terminology for domestic abuse. Um, in Australia. So I was kind of asked to speak um, at the launch of those guidelines, which was fantastic, um, and was able to speak to the Australian Banking Association, which is kind of the equivalent of um, the British Bankers Association in the UK, which is now known um, as UK Finance. Um, and it was quite funny, really, um, on two counts. Um, the first was I was actually put in contact with UK Finance via the person who led this work at the Australia Banking Association. So actually all the work that we then did with them was initiated through a contact that I'd made in Australia. So that was sort of quite funny in terms of how that turned out. Um, but also during my travels, um, I met a fantastic um, man called Norm Kalkowski. Again, Norm, if you're listening, hi. Um, our team at Surviving Economic Abuse absolutely adores Norm. Um, he is such an advocate for um, what banks can do to support victims and survivors um, and basically just starts from a place of belief. Um, and we knew that kind of pushing the banking agenda in the UK would be quite challenging. Um, and what we did was actually invite Norm over um, to the UK and he actually spoke at our, our inaugural um, banking conference, which took place in December 2018. Um, and he also attended a number of meetings with me at the Home Office. Um, we met with... Um, Majesty's Treasury, um, we met with a number of banks and building societies with UK finance, and he really kind of described, um, you know, the difference that could be made in this space, um, you know, in a way that I just couldn't, um, because he came from and represented um, what we were trying to change. Um, so that was just absolutely fantastic. Um, and that's a picture of myself and Norm, um, just bottom right there. Um, and I would say the work in this space is um, particularly important. Um, victims and survivors, especially post-separation, and especially when they have um, joint financial products, um, find this one of the sort of really tricky areas to resolve. Um, and as I said, we've been working via Home Office Money to support banks and building societies. Um, again, Beck spoke to the work that NatWest and Safe Lives are also doing in this space, um, which we similarly support. Um, but certainly um, a big partnership that we've developed over that time is with Lloyds Banking Group. Um, so one in four of the UK population work with Lloyds Banking Group. Um, and we have now developed a partnership with them. Um, and they are so committed to this issue that they have actually set up a specialist domestic and financial abuse team, which sits within their broader customer vulnerability team. Um, and as of September last year, a member of our team is permanently seconded to that team just to make sure um, that we are able to kind of feed our expertise um, and advise on safety issues for victims and survivors. Um, so I think one of the things that I dreamed about happening um, when I set up the charity, um, is kind of illustrated by that development um, and it just you know it just makes me feel um, really proud because back in 2017 as I said there was just very enough very very little that we could direct victims and survivors to but through this kind of work and this capacity building um, that has now changed. 
So the other thing I wanted to draw on was learning from um, my visit to the US. Um, we know that one of the biggest issues, again, for victims and survivors of economic abuse is coerced debt. Um, so we know that 95% of domestic abuse survivors experience economic abuse and 60% of those 95 will have been um, coerced into taking debt out in their name. Um, and we know, again, this is one of the real issues moving forward um, because they can be left again for decades paying back debt, um, not having ever seen you know, what that money bought or seen that money in and of itself. Um, and that also, you know, is a permanent reminder that every month where a debt repayment goes um, out of the bank account is a permanent reminder of the abuse that someone's experienced. So it was really important to us that we dealt with that. Um, and I was really inspired by work, um, again, as I said, in the US um, around coerced debt. And um, it was actually our founding project, um, the Economic Justice Project. And I don't think we'd have got, well, I don't say I don't think we wouldn't have got the funding for this project had we not been able to point to the good practice that was already happening in the US, because it really gave the confidence um, to the funder, which was the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, um, that you know, something could be done in this area. Um, and we got to the point where working in partnership with an organisation called Money Advice Plus, um, we have at least sort of a 25% success rate in terms of having co coerced debt written off by creditors. So they recognise economic abuse has happened and they wipe that debt. Um, and the number of tearful phone calls that we've had with victims and survivors where that has happened um, truly demonstrates how life-changing that can be. Um, but what we want to do now is systematically introduce that um, across um, all creditors. So again, we know that every victim or survivor who's coerced into debt on average um, has five different creditors which they need to deal with. Um, and so what we do is support them and we're piloting something called the Economic Abuse Evidence Form. So the idea being that we support them um, via Money Advice Plus um, and going forward other money and debt advisors um, to evidence that economic abuse has happened and to send this form to the five different creditors um, and then have them respond um, so that the victim survivor doesn't have to keep engaging with lots of different creditors and have to tell their story over and over again. Um, and really excitingly, um, part of the work of the Money and Pension Service um, in the UK, um, which is responsible for the UK financial wellbeing strategy, um, is to support this pilot. Um, the idea that we should roll out the pilot um, and have kind of a, a national response to this issue going forward. Um, so again, a real sort of important systems change. Um, and this is replicated again on a model that already works in the UK, which is the um, mental health evidence form. So it's kind of based on a, a form that already exists in relation to another customer vulnerability. So I just wanted to um, finish up um, by talking a little bit again about the um, work that we've done in relation to the bill. Um, I've left this to last because it's kind of the most recent um, achievement for the team. Um, we're still quite small, but um, we like to say that we're mighty. Um, so on the 1st of March, after several years again of lobbying, um, influencing government um, around the domestic abuse bill, um, having already had economic abuse recognised within it, um, we knew from our research um, that six in 10 cases of coercive and controlling behaviour that were going before the courts um, had some kind of economic abuse element within them. Um, but sometimes the separation between or the point at which someone's left an abuser can sometimes be a little bit kind of blurred. Um, and the legal provisions for someone experiencing economic abuse post-separation um, weren't um, appropriate really for economic abuse. They kind of focus more on the kind of the physical abuse side of things. Um, and so we argued that, um, you know, if economic abuse was a form of coercive controlling behaviour and it did happen post-separation alongside other forms of abuse, then actually we needed to extend the provision um, within seven, section 76 of the Serious Crime Act so that behaviour could be recognised post-separation as well. Um, and we worked um, really hard and in partnership with an academic um, called Cass Beeman back down in um, Sussex University um, and with uh, Jess Phillips in the Commons and then Baroness Lister in the Lords. Um, and we were one of the um, few charities who kind of pushed an amendment um, which the government accepted. And on the 1st of March of this year, um, it accepted um, our amendment and has kind of drafted that within the domestic abuse bill as it currently stands um, which is very exciting um, and again just hearing from the victims and survivors um, that we've been working with who have driven this work from the very beginning you know who would communicate that one of the real issues for them moving forward was that there was no way of criminalizing um, this behavior that as I said many have continued to experience for decades 
um, you know, again, their response um, and we were able to achieve this, you know, just kind of really, again, validated the work of the team more broadly, I think, um, because we know what a difference that will make to victims and survivors. So I think just in summary, um, our approach is all about that ecosystem. Um, as Beck talked about, we work with individuals in terms of awareness raising. That might be an individual experience in economic abuse. It might be an individual working on the front line to understand what domestic abuse looks like and economic abuse specifically in particular contexts. We work with professionals to try to improve their response to victims and survivors. Um, we then seek to um, influence the systems within which they work. You know, sometimes their own organisation won't have the policies and procedures in place that enable them to do what they want to do. So we can work with firms to change policies and procedures um, and where sometimes firms are regulated or organisations are regulated or sit within an industry, um, which is preventing them from doing what they want. You know, we'll talk at the industry level as well, continuing always to increase that space for action in terms of what obstacles we can remove for a victim survivor moving forward. Um, and again, I think as the kind of the beginning and the end of my presentation has shown, that also extends uh, to the government level. Um, so kind of at the highest level, I would find the issues that we need to address for victims and survivors. Um, and again, having those barriers removed at that level. So I just wanted to leave you with some contact information. Um, again, as Beck said, um, sometimes you understand an issue differently when you've been um, listening to something um, that kind of um, frames it in a way that you might not have understood it um, previously. It can throw up um, personal experiences. It can also make you understand the experiences of friends, family, colleagues in a different way as well. So I would urge anybody um, who has been affected today and or who knows someone who is uh, to check out our website um, in the UK and Beck's website um, in Australia um, because there are resources. And, you know, I'm really pleased to say that for five years later, um, you know, there are things that we can do. So thank you very much. Well, I think we will go over to questions now. So we've got quite a few questions coming in via the Q&A window. Thank you for that. And that can be found in the bottom toolbar of your Zoom window. Um, we've got quite a few nice comments as well. So I will start those now. I can see a few hands being raised as well. So feel free to just send your question through. Um, we have... What can banks do to support victims of economic abuse, especially in relation to the new financial code of conduct for vulnerable customers? I think that's referring to an Australian code of conduct. I think there's um, a lot of credit actually deserves to go to um, the banks in Australia. Um, uh, Nicola was talking about uh, some of the work that NAB has done. I used to work with Commonwealth Bank. I know Westpac is doing stuff as well. Um, and, and the Commonwealth Bank has, has done a, a, a range of um, research pieces um, and is developing some more support mechanisms for people outside of just their customer base. Um, I think one of the things that I would be keen for, for banks to look at um, and, and as I said, with due acknowledgement of everything they have already done is um, taking a look at their products, um, at the original design of the product. So at the moment, we're still mostly focused on how do we support people who have experienced economic abuse? How do we restore their financial independence? How do we get them onto an, an individual bank account? How do we deal with this debt? So I'm really interested in what banks can do in, I guess, um, in the earlier stages, ensuring people understand um, what it is, what the implications will be of signing up to particular products um, and whether there are ways we can design products that reduce the um, potential for abuse by perpetrators. Thanks, Beck. Nicola, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I was just going to say I'd echo everything um, Beck says. There's so much kind of commonality um, in terms of our systems approaches across both countries. Um, but what I also would say is that we know that victims and survivors um, will usually bank across a number of institutions. Um, and I think what we're seeing through rolling out the economic use evidence form with multiple creditors is that it really does demand an industry response. Um, one of the challenges that we see with individual banks is that they do their best for a customer. But kind of only knowing um, you know what products 
they might hold within their bank that they are engaging with at that time. Um, and they might not be aware that they hold products um, elsewhere with other organisations. And so it's about kind of having that holistic picture. Um, and it's a really challenging space for banks to be working in because of competition laws and, you know, um, not kind of sharing information, um, obviously in relation to customers, data protection, et cetera, across institutions. Um, but I think what we're really seeing is the need for some kind of industry-wide response, which facilitates um, some sharing in particular contexts. Um, to make sure that we can really understand, as I said, the kind of complete picture for a victim and survivor and banks can work together to ensure that it's the best outcome for them, um, as opposed to kind of taking action in silos, which is currently the case. Thanks, Nicola. Um, I have a question here from Rachel. Um, thank you so much for your great work. Uh, what is being done in the UK to stop abusers continuing to use economic abuse once the survivor has left, namely through the child maintenance service? And there's a few um, comments and questions on the child maintenance service as well, just to touch on that, um, who seem to do nothing to help. So could, could you touch on that, either of you? I mean, I can start in the UK context, and I'm sure Beck will have something to say. She's kind of nodding in a in a way that she um, has lots to say in the same way that I do. Um, so I've already talked about post-separation abuse being massive and we see the child maintenance system, again, as a system being used by perpetrators to continue that abuse post-separation. Um, so something that we did do and we published last week um, was a rapid review into economic safety needs arising for victims and survivors because of COVID. And um, we put out a survey to victims and survivors and we knew that victims and survivors currently living with abusers would struggle um, to fill in that survey um, because they wouldn't have kind of the space and be safe um, to be able to do so. So we did speak to um, professionals supporting them as well. But we did hear from over 300 victims and survivors post-separation who really flagged up the issue of how child maintenance payments were being used, um, particularly in the context of COVID. Um, so we've always had a situation um, where um, abusers have failed to make child maintenance payments, um, sometimes have varied the amount that they've paid, um, basically try to seek to continue to control the well-being of victims and any children that they might have um, post-separation in that way. Um, and what we found in relation to COVID was because of other measures that the government had put in place to support victims and well to support the population more broadly um, through our welfare system was that it moved a lot of workers from the child maintenance system across um, to our department for work and pensions um, kind of welfare benefit universal credit team um, and that meant that at the very least you know prior to that you would have had to have provided you know evidence as to why you were going to stop making payments for example or might need to reduce payments um, we saw as I said they were already abusing the system and using the system um, and perpetrators used COVID in the um, excuse, um, you know, in terms of the economic impact to just phone up and make claims that they could no longer afford to make those payments and so stop doing so. And no evidence was sought in relation to that. Um, it was decided that that, you know, evidence would be sought a bit further down the line. Um, but for victims and survivors who themselves had experienced a negative economic impact, you know, of COVID um, and who were already struggling, you know, they kind of lost, you know, an income. And, um, we found from that survey that eight in 10 of victims and survivors had had a negative impact um, in relation to the child maintenance um, service. So as I said, it's a massive issue generally. Um, there are a number of sanctions in place for non-payment, but we don't ever see them used. Um, we hear really concerning practice. And again, it goes back to um, Beck's um, point about really training on economic abuse specifically. Um, you know, some organisations get domestic abuse general training, but unless they really understand economic abuse and how money and other economic resources are being used as part of that coercive controlling behaviour and see how they are themselves within the systems that they work often manipulated by perpetrators, they don't really understand it. And so they'll say things like, well, you know, um, you know, despite the fact actually, you know, child maintenance system is set up for parents, you know, for one reason or another who can't come up um, with a solution themselves in terms of supporting children. You know, it's, it is designed for survivors of domestic abuse, but you will hear things like, well, can't you just go to the perpetrator and ask them to start paying? Um, so some really kind of dangerous practice um, is also introduced in that way. Um, so I think it's a very long winded way of me saying it's a massive issue, um, especially post separation um, and one that we hear about all the time from victims and survivors. So in terms of kind of our work going forward, 
Um, as I said, we're informed by the needs of victims and survivors, and we will consult in terms of what our next big campaign is. But certainly one of the issues that I think are kind of in the running um, for our next big campaign, um, and which we kind of work with other um, charities in the UK, like Gingerbread, um, for example, um, which is kind of a charity for one parent families, um, will be to kind of focus our um, attention on the child maintenance system and the reform that needs to happen there. And I, I would add to that, obviously, it's a massive, massive problem in Australia as well. Uh, and it intersects with a number of systems which are being used or even weaponized by perpetrators to avoid paying that child maintenance. Um, there is a safety function, um, which is that if you're experiencing um, violence, you can apply for an exemption, uh, which is something that the victim has to do to basically kind of give the perpetrator a get out of jail free card, like they don't have to pay it because it's too dangerous to ask. And that, um, as you can imagine, is kind of where is the justice in that? It's, it feels incredibly unjust and it is. Um, you've got perpetrators manipulating the tax system to um, uh, make their income look smaller and smaller. That's if they're even bothering to engage with the tax system at all. Um, and my real concern at the moment is the way um, children have become pawns in a, um, a battle over reducing child custody payments, um, child's um, support payments. And so you're seeing custody battles in family court with perpetrators who've never um, been particularly interested in spending time with the children now demanding 50%, really for no other reason than um, getting out of that payment. So there is a massive piece of work that needs to be done. I would like to see actually a complete disconnection between uh, custody and child support. I know that's easier said than done, but it's a huge piece of work that needs to happen there. I would again echo all of that and just also say that what we're calling for is um, a kind of guarantee that payments will be made. So if the non-resident parent doesn't pay, then the government should pay. Um, and then should seek to recover the money from the non-paying parent because we're just seeing a system where the non-paying parent is not being um, chased at all. But I think if the government was having to make that payment, there would be more, um, you know, motivation maybe to uh, to chase that payment. So um, that's another potential solution um, to ensure that there is that kind of security and that um, that knowledge that that money is coming. Thank you both. Um, a question here. It is great to hear that economic abuse will be recognised under the new legislation. Will this apply retrospectively? Yeah, that's always um, a big question. So it was a question that used to be asked around coercive control and behaviour offence as it currently stands. Um, and so the answer generally is no, um, because until the legislation comes in place and, for example, makes it a criminal offence, you can't criminalise behaviour that wasn't criminal. Before it happened. However, um, because we're looking at post-separation abuse, um, it could be that someone who had experienced economic abuse and left and continues to experience economic abuse um, could still now use this provision because it's behaviour that is ongoing. Um, so if, if someone is currently still experiencing economic abuse or other forms of post-separation control, when the broadened defence comes into being, um, they can use it again and could refer to previous um, abuse as part of that, but certainly if it's now ended, unfortunately, you can't use it retrospectively now. Thanks for that. And another question um, on that. Nicola, I know the definition in the bill hasn't received assent yet, but do you have any hopes or expectations of how it will be used by courts once it is? Thank you as always for the work you do and thanks back too. Well, thank you for your question. Um, so I suppose I think it's kind of the, the broader messages. So in as much as the statutory definition includes economic abuse, it means statutory agencies will need to respond um, and take um, note of economic abuse. So it means that, you know, when victims and survivors report it now, it will need to be taken seriously in a way that perhaps previously it wasn't. Um, so we're hoping that will kind of infiltrate um, other systems as well, uh, because it very firmly locates economic abuse as a tactic of coercive and controlling behaviour, which you would hope, you know, the family courts um, would take into consideration also. Um, so there's something about kind of consistency, I suppose, across our understanding of domestic abuse and where economic abuse sits within that, 
across different types of um, legislation. Uh, so the domestic abuse bill is mostly criminal in nature, um, but again, it's because it's kind of establishing particular understandings um, of domestic and therefore economic abuse. Those should um, be recognised at least um, within other systems, such as the family justice system. Um, and certainly it means, you know, within statutory agencies in and of themselves, um, this issue will be taken seriously in a way that it wasn't. Thank you. Um, a comment here. Hi, this is a great talk. What level of inclusion do you have with recognising economic abuse in respect of minority groups, including, example, migrant women? Thank you. Uh, so I, certainly a lot of the research that I've looked at has um, been Pretty representative. Uh, I think in the US especially, and it's not to say it's not happening elsewhere, but um, there's a, a very significant representation of um, women of colour in the research. Um, and in fact, I think that applies in terms of what I've seen in, in the UK and Australia. It is interesting that in the US there's, um, there's actually a debate about how to convince um, systems and communities that uh, white middle-class women also experience economic abuse. So I spent some time with some organizations um, that work with what they call women of affluence um, because I suspect that the welfare, the sort of almost an absence of the welfare system in the US means you actually see significant numbers of um, marginalized communities represented in economic abuse and domestic violence um, figures. Um, indeed shelters and a lot of the services and I guess the stereotypes and myths and assumptions that exist around um, domestic violence in the US that you know, there are clear ideas about this happening to um, people of colour more so than other people so yeah so in the US they've kind of got this other thing happening which is um, uh, looking and convincing people that uh, women white middle class women also experience domestic abuse. I'm doing a bit of work at the moment actually and kind of struggling to find um, information in relation to race um, in terms of overall prevalence. Um, so I think we understand certain ways in which um, women will experience economic abuse and perpetrators always personalise coercive control um, and sometimes that will um, link to somebody's race. Um, but what we then we also see is that certain systems um, create um, economic insecurity. So Beck spoke um, to the um, work that South of Black Sisters does in the US, um, in the UK even, um, around the no recourse to public funds piece. Um, so we have a system at the moment um, which is not compatible actually with the Istanbul Convention, um, which is something we have signed up to um, in the UK. Um, it's kind of a European wide um, agreement around responding to violence against women and girls, but we haven't yet ratified it. And the domestic abuse bill is supposed to help us ratify um, the European um, Istanbul Convention. However, one of the principles of the convention is non-discrimination, but we don't see that in terms of the provisions for victims and survivors in the UK. So if you are in the UK um, and you don't have um, entitlement to remain in the UK, so you're here on a temporary basis, um, so basically you don't have citizenship um, or leave to remain, um, then you can't um, use the um, welfare system, um, which means, you know, again, we've both spoken to the importance of kind of cash payments and be able to access money. Um, so a victim and survivor, you know, kind of really um, quite often relies on the benefit system in terms of having the resource to get away. Um, so at the minute, we've kind of got a system where kind of the immigration in and of itself, immigration system in and of itself kind of creates an economic dependency because it says actually this person who sponsored you into the UK is economically responsible for you. So it creates dependency in the first place, which is dangerous. And then there's no provision um, to access um, economic resources in your own name. Um, and we actually argue that that's a form of um, economic abuse that's kind of state perpetrated. Um, so, you know, we argue that all victims and survivors should have access to the money that they need um, to be able to leave and to re-establish their life um, independently. Um, so it's a real problem. And it's one of the issues that we've been really pushing for um, in the last few weeks 
um, alongside organisations like South for Black Sisters and the Latin American Women's Rights Service. Um, they're both um, organisations that are led by Black and minoritised women for Black and minoritised women, um, and we've been really supportive of changes. Um, but unfortunately, all the amendments in relation to migrant women um, and their well-being um, have fallen. Uh, so the Lords were supportive of them. The Commons um, dismissed the Lords' recommendations, and now it's gone back to the Lords. So it'll be really interesting to see whether they push this further, this issue any further. Um, but at the minute, there's a real disparity um, in terms of protection that's available, um, which, as I said, is not consistent with the non-discrimination principle. Um, and if I'm honest, it makes it really hard to be really excited about the bill. We're so pleased with our wins within it. Um, but until all women and victims and survivors um, of other genders and, um, you know, are protected, then, um, you know, we can't say that it's a kind of a, a landmark piece of legislation, which is what the intention was. If I can just add to that, um, again, very similar issues. And I think there is a big piece in terms of the interaction with the immigration system, um, domestic family violence services, um, at a range of other systems, but we've had a couple of glimmers of hope uh, here in Australia. Uh, one was during COVID, uh, the New South Wales government, um, which is the state government where I am, um, has um, extended the ability for women experiencing um, violence on temporary visas to be able to access healthcare. Uh, so that was a huge development uh, last year. And just, I think in the last week, uh, the federal government has announced at least a pilot program anyway, in which they will be providing cash assistance for women wanting to escape an abusive partner who are on temporary visas and wouldn't otherwise. And that's, uh, I think, going to be administered by the Red Cross. Uh, it's quite limited, unfortunately, I think, to a thousand women a year. So, um, but it's the start of a recognition that there's a serious problem here. So, he's hoping. Thank you both. And we've got quite a few questions, which is great. Um, I'll just pick one, sorry. Um, is SEA working with utilities companies to ensure appropriate action, excuse me, is taken, especially with regards to joint accounts? Yeah, it's a really good question. I laughed because I was actually talking to a utility provider yesterday. So absolutely is the answer. Um, I think what we do obviously is um, look at data and what we're hearing from victims and survivors um, through lots of different methods um, every month and the utilities um, issues are usually kind of in the top five um, so we decided this year that we were going to try and um, address utilities um, it's kind of part of that work that we're doing around coerced debt more broadly um, so yeah certainly it's an area um, that we're looking at and we're seeking to bring um, some utility companies into the economic abuse evidence form pilot that I spoke to in phase two um, so yeah, I think I kind of watched this space piece. Um, we're aware of some organisations in the utility space who are just fantastic. Um, you know, a lot of organisations now have um, customer vulnerability teams. Um, you know, we are aware of some which kind of operate in that lovely norm way where they just believe. So they're usually supportive of victims and survivors, but that's not the case across the piece. Um, so like everything, it's about kind of trying to get that message out to everyone and ensure some kind of consistency. For a victim or survivor, whoever they contact, that they kind of get that response that they need. Yeah, it's a space that's been building and developing um, in Australia. I think the energy companies have recently introduced their sort of code of conduct around customer vulnerability. Um, there are initiatives like Thriving Communities Partnership, um, where utilities and a whole range of organisations across sectors can really learn from each other about how to adopt better practices in support of people who might be experiencing uh, domestic violence and economic abuse. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll see improved practice um, over time. And the other uh, piece of work that's happening there is the Economic Abuse Reference Group, um, which the Centre for Women's Economic Safety is also a member of. Um, they uh, uh, have been doing a lot of work with utility companies uh, and I think Again, Victoria really leading the way in terms of what best practice can look like. So um, I would be urging utility companies who are interested to learn more to, to look to Victoria, to look to Thriving Communities Partnership, um, to look to some of the good practice guides from the Economic Abuse Reference Group. Just to add to that, actually, Carolyn Bond, who oversees that um, network, again, also shared um, some really great practice around engaging with utilities just yesterday. 
Um, so again, we can, as a kind of after this event, we can share some links um, to some great resources like that. Great. And sort of a related question to that one um, about credit rating companies. Um, hi, and thank you so much for the webinar and all the work you've done. I'm wondering if credit rating companies are starting to approach the issue, it would be great to have a way to explain that a low rating can sometimes be the result of economic abuse. Thank you. I might jump in there. There's a, um, an interesting project that I saw in the US called the Independence Project, which is a survivor focused program specifically about rebuilding a credit score and your credit report um, after leaving um, someone who's been economically abusing you. Um, in the US, uh, credit reporting is much more sort of, I guess, advanced than it is certainly in Australia, I'm not sure about in, in the UK. Um, and it can be used for almost anything, for employment, for housing, for financial products and so on. In Australia, it's been limited, but we're moving, we're just moving now to comprehensive credit reporting. So I think this is gonna blow up. This issue is gonna get much bigger. Um, there are some conversations happening with one credit reporting agency here. I think there's an early conversation. I can't say any more than that. Um, but in fact, one of my recommendations um, in the Churchill um, report is that uh, credit rating agencies need to get on board with this. They need to learn about economic abuse and they need to work with advocates in the field to look at ways that they can support people not to have ruined credit ratings and therefore, you know, the, the impact of that on their access to financial products, to housing, to being able to rebuild their economic security. I mean, similarly, we just echo it's a massive issue. Um, so actually sometimes you can use a credit report as a form of evidence around economic abuse because you can see that someone had great credit rating before meeting someone, that, you know, completely nosedive. And then after they left, we know a lot of victims and survivors put a lot of effort into building it back up again. So quite often, actually, you can see an experience of economic abuse just via someone's credit report. Um, so I suppose issues that we've been working on here um, included being able to access your economic abuse, economic abuse, your um, credit report safely. Um, so we were aware, especially when you've got joint products, that sometimes if you access your credit report, but you are financially linked to somebody else, that your act of accessing and updating your details can sometimes be seen by the person that you're financially linked to. Um, so we've done a lot of work, um, especially with Experian, which is one of kind of the big um, organisations here in the UK, um, around addressing that in terms of safety issues. Um, and we've actually got a resource on our website, which we've developed in partnership with Experian and Money Advice Plus, in terms of being able to access your credit report safely. Uh, similarly, um, I know organisations like Refuge, which is another domestic abuse charity, um, has flagged this issue, and we work with them and Safe Lives and various um, different banking partners um, to try and address this issue. And we're hoping to have a kind of a roundtable conversation um, about that in the next month or so. Um, and then something else I would just add is that kind of one of our hopes potentially around the economic abuse evidence form is that in addition to um, using it to share evidence of economic abuse with creditors, it could be something that could also be shared with the um, people who produce the credit ratings um, and perhaps um, be something that could then um, alter a credit rating. Um, because I think, you know, what victims and survivors rightly argue is that, you know, your credit rating should be a reflection of your behaviour, but of course you've been controlled and that's not a reflection of your behaviour. So if you can demonstrate that you've been abused in that way, it might be that we might be able to um, kind of use that as a piece of evidence. Um, and there has been some situations where, based on kind of previous examples, um, credit reference agencies have been able to alter um, a credit report. And we would really sort of argue and hope that they would consider doing that for survivors of economic abuse going forward. Thank you. Um, a comment that mobile phone companies also need training on customer vulnerability, absolutely. Um, and Nicola, you mentioned that utilities are in the top five frustrations, oops, where did it go? Um, top five frustrations of economic abuse from survivors. What are the other key areas of frustration? I knew I was going to be asked that. That's a memory test. Um, so coerced debt um, is another one. Um, access to bank accounts um, is another one, um, particular relate, um, issues in relation to um, housing arrears, 
um, and the fifth is in relation to mortgages specifically. Um, so one of the massive pieces of work that we've been trying to do with banks and deals and societies um, is around sort of mortgages and some of the problems um, that we see there post-separation. Um, and I think it's a good example, actually, again, of what Beck talked about, where you kind of see an intersection of lots of systems that just aren't working together very well at all. Um, so a lot of victims and survivors who leave and then try to sell their property, um, they might go through a financial settlement and have a court order that the property should be sold um, and, or, and or that the property should be um, transferred into somebody else's name. Um, but sometimes the banks can't transfer the property into someone else's name because the affordability test in relation to mortgages isn't met. Um, so they can't kind of do what the um, court has said needs doing, which is a great source of frustration. Um, but then similarly, we see, for example, victims and survivors might move out of the property. So one of the cases that is live at the moment is a situation where victim survivors moved out, they're paying a lot of money in rent. Um, they were the agreement was that the perpetrator would continue to pay the mortgage um, and the house would be sold. Um, but then COVID happened. And again, it was one of the things that's supposed to support victims and survivors and people more generally. Um, you could take payment holidays in relation to the mortgage. So the abuser has now taken a holiday payment, not paying anything towards um, you know, the mortgage, which therefore means there's no impetus at all um, to sell the house and to move out. Um, even though it's a joint mortgage, and this is where the problem is, um, he's been able to do that on his say so only. Um, so she continues to pay a lot of money in rent every single month, um, is trying to get back to court to get the property sold. She can't access legal aid. That's another system problem because the equity in the house is seen um, as being a resource that she has, even though she can't access it, she can't access it until the property is sold. So she's drained all her savings, um, running out of money doesn't know how she's going to be able to continue to pay um, that rent going forward um, and all the while you know the perpetrator sat in the house and not paying anything towards it at all um, so again just a, a kind of an example of you know one of the issues that does come up a lot and how it, un, difficult it is to, to unpick this because there's just so many different systems um, at play and we just need to find a way that you know we can do it in a way that's consistent Thanks, Nicola. Um, and there is a comment on joint accounts here as well from someone who works for a domestic abuse charity in the UK and finding the same issue arising again and again. And they take the money from the joint account um, and it's forcing victims into debts and overdrafts and the banks are often unhelpful as there are joint rights to the account and say there is nothing that can be done. Is there anything that can be done for these women? Does it come down to um, encouraging the banks to develop these policies so that they can support um, victims or what else can be done? So one of the principles within the UK kind of practice on financial abuse is around joint accounts um, and some institutions have changed their rules um, so one of the problems and the continued control post separation with joint financial products is the need for both parties to consent and you would see um, abusers again refusing to give that consent to kind of close the joint product um, and you know as that example just talked about you know quite often um, making you know putting the um the account into kind of the overdraft facility which then because of joint account both people both people are liable for um, and generally what we see also is that abusers don't tend to engage with institutions so the only person the bank can get hold of is the victim and then they're the person um, who's being kind of chased um, for the debt as it were so we do have situations now where banks will close a joint bank account without the um, abuser's consent um, that's kind of been recognised in its inter terms and conditions of economic abuse um, is the case and they will do that. Um, and certainly, and I can't talk to the detail too much because um, I have a fantastic team now who know more than me in terms of this space, um, but certainly um, where there is a overdraft of a certain amount, um, sometimes that can be kind of halved across both parties or sometimes it can be written off and ways can be found to address that. So. It's certainly not consistent, I would say, across all banks and building societies. Um, some are um, doing more in this space than others, um, but certainly it's an issue that's raised within the code of practice. Um, and I think, certainly think that idea of kind of jointly, of halving joint debt is something that actually sits within the family guidance principles back in Australia, because I was quite impressed that it talked about um, halving kind of liability in terms of joint debt. Um, which is something that would be, you know, I think it would be great if we could address that in the UK context. 
the, the new code of conduct puts a much greater emphasis on um, banks not just putting it in a too hard basket and they are required to um, not just work through um, a situation with um, uh, a couple who, if there's an economic abuse happening, um, they can certainly put a freeze on the account or do other things um, where they can't contract the perpetrator because they don't want to be contacted. So there, there are certain, um, I suppose, requirements now of banks to behave in the best interest of the customer that um, I think give them a little bit more uh, it's not wriggle room, but like there's a little bit more flexibility in how they'll um, respond to people experiencing economic abuse now. And uh, certainly anecdotally, um, uh, I'm hearing that banks are much more responsive um, to requests to freeze joint accounts. Um, and now that's not always a safe thing to request um, to do, um, but where someone does want to do that, they're, they're quite responsive um, and uh, you'll often be put through to a specialist team um, where the safety considerations are sort of first and foremost. So uh, I'm sure there's more that can be done, but there's certainly been excellent strides and the, the, the new code of conduct is very helpful as well. Thanks, Beck. Um, and from joint accounts to joint um, tenancy, um, there's a question here for Nicola. Uh, working in housing, one of the barriers we come up against is if the perpetrator is also on the tenancy agreement. I recently heard that this is something that is going to be looked at and the perpetrator will be taken off the agreement. Nicola, is this the case in the UK? Again, it was one of the issues that was raised um, by an amendment that was put forward in relation to the domestic youth abuse bill um, because that certainly has been the case although again I know individual housing associations sometimes will take a slightly different view um, again there are some great organizations um, we work in the housing space and we focus on privately owned housing um, we're part of something called the whole housing approach um, and again I think Beck mentions it in her presentation uh, so it's run um, by the domestic abuse housing alliance and other partners um, and there's a number of us who kind of um, look at a particular area um, of kind of housing. So traditionally within the UK, you know, most of the attention was kind of focused on refuge provisions. So that would kind of be shelter provision um, using a different terminology, um, or social housing and less focus on privately rented and privately owned properties. Um, and again, it goes back to what Beck was saying actually about this kind of idea that certain people and certain demographics experience economic abuse and not everyone. Um, so, you know, one of the awful kind of stereotypes that we have in the UK is that you know you live in a council estate and you're poor and you know that's how you experience economic abuse but if you're in a detached property with a nice car on the you know the driveway there's no way that you can um, and that's just absolutely not the case um, so the focus is kind of looking at economic abuse across all different types of housing tenure and as I said within the project we do that across the piece but focus specifically on privately owned um, but a number of other organizations kind of focus on the specificities in relation to different housing tenures um, so I would really um, encourage the, the person who asked that question um, to be in contact with the Domestic Abuse Housing Alliance, who can kind of really um, kind of give a detailed answer to that question. Um, as I said, and again, as Beck just said in her response, you know, we hear anecdotal good practice, um, but it's about trying to create frameworks where there is that consistency across the piece. Um, something that I would say, though, that, um, you know, another sort of area of good practice is um, a reciprocal um, arrangement now where sometimes people are kind of struggling to leave a tenancy that they're in because actually they don't want to still be in that property because that's where the abuse happened and all the abuser knows where they are and sometimes it's quite difficult to find another property if you're in social housing um, but there's a reciprocal agreement now across local authority areas uh, where people can effectively do swaps um, so there's some you know really great sort of innovative practice out there um, and again I just encourage people to go to the Daha website to look for that. Thank you. Um, and uh, just a comment here from Jane. The Financial Ombudsman Service in the UK does a lot of work on this and is acutely aware of issues relating to consent. So that's good. Thank you, Jane, for your comment. Um, a question or two questions on the experts in experience group. Um, the first one is mine, perks of running the Q&A. Um, so is it mainly word of mouth um, that people find out about that group or how is that, um, you said you, you don't approach victims, but how do you promote that and how do people find out about it? 
Yeah, so even though we're not kind of a frontline organisation, um, because this is still a kind of work in progress and we don't have that capacity across other services that really respond to victims and survivors, we still get a lot of approaches um, because people have come up um, you know, against a number of dead ends, unfortunately. Um, and sometimes we're still able to kind of signpost or um, talk to a resource, perhaps it's on our website. Um, but sometimes there's something, you know, that we can't do. So a little bit like it was kind of the response to everyone back in 2017. Um, so where there's a particular issue that a victim survivor is struggling with um, and there's nothing that we can do in this moment to um, support, um, we always offer um, membership to the group. Um, again, there's a way of kind of working alongside us, you know, to kind of share the experience, to build the evidence base. Um, and to identify through our um, work, whether that be, you know, within organisation or industry or government, uh, to kind of really push for that. Um, so that's kind of the way in which it works. So um, it's a kind of, you know, come come work alongside us and we'll try and change that together rather than a, sorry, we can't help you, um, you know, kind of response where people are kind of left, you know, in, in you know, situations where they might feel quite helpless. Hmm. Well, it's a wonderful, um, wonderful network. Well done. Um, and there was a question about, I think it was in relation to the experts and experience group about expanding it to Europe, but I might buddy that up with the question of <laughs> other organisations that they might start something similar in Europe that's local. Uh, I mean, certainly um, something that we've developed and again, off the back of the Winston Churchill travels um, is an international network um, around responding to economic abuse. So bringing professionals together, um, whether they're frontline or academic, um, working for an organization, um, you know, in a charity partner. Um, so certainly there's nothing to say that if certain groups, you know, across Europe and beyond um, wanted to create a similar group, I'm sure we could find a way of kind of linking us all up. Um, so something that we are doing this year for the first time is um, a survivor summit um, for members of our experts by experience groups. So we're going to kind of invite them to come together virtually. Um, and you can see that there'd be kind of great um, value going forward, of perhaps having you know, a number of virtual events you know, that might all be linked. Um, you know, obviously, time zone allowing slightly easier in Europe, maybe slightly more challenging internationally. Um, but, you know, I think there's great power um, in kind of linking victims and survivors up. Um, across the piece and we'd be hugely supportive of that if anyone else wanted to do something similar. Thank you and I think the um, the Australian Trust would also anything we can do to support that um, that would be fantastic to see an international impact like that. Um, there is another question for Beck here. Um, thank you for such a brilliant and inspiring presentation. Uh, with regards to direct cash assistance, could Rebecca say a bit more about where the money came from to set up those schemes and whether they've been evaluated? So I think you did touch on this with your academic report, um, but over to you, Beck. Sure. So there were, there were a variety of programs. The Free From Survivor Safety Fund was a fund that was... Um, dispersing donations. So it was from anyone who wanted to know to donate to that fund in the context of COVID. Um, and to the extent I wouldn't call it an evaluation, but the survey of um, people who received that grant, which I believe um, was actually that they actually responded to the survey after they received the grant. And so there's, you know, so there's a, a lot of significant feedback about the value of that and what that meant to them. Um, I'm not aware of an evaluation of um, the NatWest Safe Lives. I think that's probably still too new, relatively. Um, and what was I going to say? That, oh, the whole housing approach, I think, has had a, a bit more of a rigorous um, uh, review of its processes. And there's uh, actually something called the whole housing, Nick, tell me if I get this wrong, the whole housing toolkit, which includes... Um, uh, not just sort of what the pilot involved, but um, what the outcomes were. And so there's, that's freely available, I think, from the Domestic Abuse Housing Alliance. Again, sorry if I've got the name wrong. Um, so there's some much more, um, there's, a, there's a bit more evidence around um, what difference that made to people. Did I, cut, did I answer the question there? Yeah. I think so, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, we have two more questions and then I think we might be at time. 
Um, so first question, um, I know that in Australia, perpetrators who owe child maintenance are not allowed to leave the country until the arrears are paid. Can this be done? Or does this apply in the UK as well? Certainly one of the sanctions for non-payment is to have your passport taken away. Um, so I would assume that was a, it would be a similar scenario, uh, but we never, we just never see it happen. It's just kind of complete lack of use of sanctions and or enforcement. I don't know what your experience is, Beck. Do you see that happen? Uh, no, and in fact, there was just a, um, a report I was reading. Unfortunately, I can't bring the, the exact details to mind, but I can bring to mind the visual that went with it, which was the chart on the um, percentage of actual clawback, successful um, clawback of um, payments that haven't been made, and it's so low. So it was just like a down here as a percentage of the overall. I can't remember the exact figures, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. So there, there are sanctions that exist, and I'm not sure that they're being used particularly often. I think just, you know, one of these kind of perverse systems issues um, that we see is ways in which um, perpetrators stop victims and survivors from leaving the country. So, you know, you've kind of got a system that wants to stop them as a punishment for not paying child maintenance. But um, we hear increasingly um, perpetrators who won't kind of give consent for their children to have a passport, for example, um, so they can't therefore leave the country. Um, so, you know, it's just... You know, when Beck said at the beginning that, you know, we can't talk about every single tactic of economic abuse, um, sometimes you feel like you've heard them all and then you just kind of hear more and more. It's just such a massive issue and just so many different kind of facets that we need to address. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, we are at time now, so I might just hand back to Sarah. Um, and I think there were a few other um, questions that we will hopefully get back to you on email as well, but back to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Rose. Um, so we'll be drawing this event to a close. I'd like to, first of all, thank our speakers, Rebecca Glenn and Dr. Nicola sharp Jess, for their time today. It's been a real privilege to learn responses to economic abuse from an international perspective. I've certainly learned a lot. Um, if you'd like to find out more about the Centre for Women's Economic Safety, you can do so at their website, cwes.org.au, and you can also sign up for updates there. Uh, you can follow them on Facebook at Women's Economic Safety, on LinkedIn at Centre for Women's Economic Safety, and finally, you can follow Rebecca on Twitter at Beck underscore Glenn. Uh, likewise, if you'd like to find out more about surviving economic abuse, you can do so at survivingeconomicabuse.org and you can also sign up for a newsletter there. You can follow them on Instagram and LinkedIn at Surviving Economic Abuse, on Facebook at SEA Resource 17 and on Twitter at SEA Resource. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank our audience for joining us and participating with such a diverse range of questions. It's been wonderful to hear all of your experiences and be able to discuss different angles to the topic. And it's just been great to share this space and I hope you will bring the awareness of economic abuse into your personal and professional lives. A big thank you from all of us and goodbye. <laughs>